And this is going to be the first talk and probably the only one today uh, unless the other speaker shows up. So uh, this is me, Andras Veres Senkirai, also known as DNet, and I'm going to talk about uh, building a DIY Zero Trust SSH CA. And those are really nice letters. Uh, but first of all, who am I? I have some too many letter abbreviations and I'm working as a pen tester and tool maker for a company called Silent Signal, which I am a co-founder of. And uh, by tool maker, I usually mean uh, building hacking related stuff, but I also try to build uh, proof of concepts that demonstrates how to do something securely. And this talk is going to be about such a project where I try to demonstrate how things could be built more securely. And first of all, I'm going to talk, talk, talk about the basics, what, what the context of the problem is, and then I'm going to show you the problem itself, how I solved it, and then some closing of thoughts. So, SSH. Uh, raise your hand if you know what SSH is. Okay, great. Some people know SSH. Uh, so first of all, it's a really complex protocol. It's not complicated, it's not convoluted, it's just complex. Fortunately, all its details are specified publicly in RFCs and it has several layers, so it's a really nice decoupled design and in, uh, in many ways it's better than TLS. It does something like TLS, but better. So for example, it had a PFS, perfect forward secrecy, from day one. And uh, like TLS, the default is it authenticates the server. And of course, the client can also authenticate uh, himself or herself, and there are multiple methods for that. The simplest is password, but there are more complex ones, which I will present shortly. And the other part of the context is hardware tokens, and today they can be cheap because they are mass manufactured, because people are starting to realize that passwords are not the best way to authenticate people. And sometimes it can even be free. Uh, for example, if you install the app called Krypton on your smartphone, it can become a, a uh, hardware token, which might be hackable, but at least it's more secure than if you just store a key on your computer or try to remember a password. And uh, if you know two-factor authentication, uh, it can be something you have, because uh, usually the key cannot be extracted from the hardware token itself. And uh, sometimes it can even enforce something you know because you need to enter some kind of pin or password to unlock the token or something you are because, uh, for example, now there are YubiKeys which have a built-in uh, biometric uh, fingerprint reader. So it can do two-factor authentication in a single device. And uh, these can be used in several ways. And these result in vastly different security levels because I will show you they are not equal. The problem is that they can be lost and if you lose one, as I said, you cannot extract the key, now you have problems. And the best thing is that they can be standardized. And uh, I put some letters down there and I will show you what some of them mean in the rest of this presentation. So now you have to know the context, SSH and hardware tokens, and now I'm going to talk about the problem itself. So, things that this won't apply to are small organizations which are not of technical nature, so they usually only have few servers, maybe even just a single server, a few users, for example a sysadmin and no one else, and then it just works great manually, so you have a password set or you have an SSH key set up on the server and it works great then you, are, you probably won't learn anything good from this presentation. At the other end of the spectrum are big organizations where you have single sign-on. So while I'm going to talk about SSH certificates, for example, they can be used to use SSO on SSH. That's great, they all start with SS and silent signal as well. Uh, so SSO works great with SSH certificates because you can say that the user logged in successfully on the SSO portal, so now I will generate a certificate with a five minute uh, validity so that you can log into the server once and it works great for that. But the problem is that this now becomes a single point of failure and only big organizations can keep up a staff 
that can react to such a failure. So for example, with a small organization, you can basically kill your whole IT system with having such a single point of failure that doesn't have dedicated people to repair if it breaks. So the problem that this presentation will address are the organizations between these two extremes, where you, for example, have technical users that need to log in but are not humans, so for example, they might not have tokens, how to revoke access, and how to use tokens so that you can log in securely and uh, use SSH. So first of all, as I mentioned, not all hardware token methods are created equal. So for example, YubiKey has this so-called OTP, this was their original offering, I think, where it presents itself as a keyboard, an HID, human interface device, so that it's compatible with everything that can handle USB keyboards, which is basically every device that makes sense. Uh, but the problem is that while it's really easy to implement, for example, you just install a PAM module, it's not so secure because if you can do a man-in-the-middle attack and get one of these OTPs before it's sent to the server, you can use it to authenticate in the name of the user. So I just show you a quick demo. In this case, there's the image while I press the little golden circle on the device and now it enters that long stream of letters into a web application that can be used to validate this stuff. As you can see, uh, the OTP itself, you can't see any of this. This is a long string of letters and it contains a nonce. So this is really a one-time password. And it shows you a serial number of the device itself and when it was generated. And with this way, if you use the same API, you can just validate users really easily. If I enter another one, because I put the focus in the input box and I press it again, now there is another OTP. You can see that these differ, so these are not the same strings, thus they validate. And that's really easy, but as you can see, there are a number of problems with it. So I would say that this should be only used as a last resort case. So there is also SSH public key authentication. If you've been here a few years ago, uh, Lerer and McLemon did a really great presentation about everything you wanted to know about SSH. They, of course, include public key authentication. It's one of the first cool things that people learn about SSH is that you can use public key authentication. For example, in this case, you cannot use man in the middle because as part of the challenge response uh, authentication using public key signatures, certain information about the connection, the ephemeral keys themselves are included in that challenge so that the attacker cannot really reuse your signature. And for example, that's why, that's the reason behind why Balabit uh, SCB SHA control box cannot really work the normal way with public key authentication. And this is great. For example, in case of technical users, you can limit what the key can do. So you can assign a public key to a shell script, but it cannot do anything. So if the, if the private part of the key, the attacker is, grabs that, that private key, they cannot just log in and do anything. It can be limited to, for example, just issuing a single command in the name of that user. The problem is how can you manage these keys? There are ways to do it uh, a bit more advanced than manually. So for example, there's this authorized keys command where you can uh, give a program or shell script and OpenSSH will launch that every time when a user tries to log in. And the standard output is interpreted as the list of keys that are allowed to log in. So for example, you can use this to, to put it into a relational database or any other kind of more advanced uh, backend. And of course, the public key can come from anywhere. So you have no way of, of knowing whether it's in a, in a secure hardware token or just a plain text file. And while SSH can use uh, hardware tokens by itself, so for example, PKCS11 is, is a standard for tokens, and also GNU-PG offers this way of authenticating SSH sessions using your GNU-PG card or USB token by translating between the two worlds. 
because GNU PG can be started in a way that it offers a, a SSH agent uh, socket, which talks the same language as the original, for example, OpenSSH uh, agent. So that OpenSSH thinks, oh, I'm authenticating with my own agent, but no, it's using GNU PG. So for example, you can use GNU PG cards or just playing GNU PG keys for it. And the big problem is you have no expiration. So your keys are valid as long as, as, uh, as uh, you, know, you don't remove it from the server, which sounds good to many administrators who think that, yeah, I hate those uh, HTTPS certificates because they always expire, especially Let's Encrypt, which expires in 90 days, while I just set up these SSH keys and it's good forever. And uh, usually if something is too convenient, it's usually not secure. And of course, I'll show a small demo because maybe not everyone knows how it works. So in this case, I use SSH key GAN, which is included in the standard open SSH distribution. I set the key type to ED25519. And uh, by using the minus F demo, this will save the private key into a file called demo and uh, store the public key, as it said in the text, demo.pub because like public key and I can just simply you can see now there is a demo and the demo.pub file and the private key is there in nice base 64 encoded stuff so I will just decode it because you cannot just just trust files themselves I love this invocation because it shows you it only uses built-in tools so base64 and HD, but at the same time you get a nice ASCII dump as well as the hex dump. And you can already see some readable strings in there. And uh, it has this nice little format where every, every value has its length before it. So in this case, there is this number four, and after that there comes this string none. So it's really easy to parse, there are none of that bullshit that ASN1 is, where you have a number of ways to define it. So for example, 0B, there you have SSH-ED25519 after it, so it's a really easy format. And of course, there's the, there's the private key. There is this uh, hexadecimal 40, which means 64. And now there are, yeah, it's not perfect. Yeah, now there is uh, 64 bytes after it, and that's the key itself. That's the private key, and that's one of the reasons why we like uh, ED25519, because we have really short private keys. So this is nothing like the 2048-bit RSA key. No, this is just 255 bits. So, yeah? Is the, uh, the, uh, the, string on, the last string on the hex dump a comment? Probably, probably yes. That's probably the comment. Okay. And you can also also see the comment there at the public key. The public key is made up of three parts. The first one is the user readable part, which is also which will also be included as we decode it. That's just there so that users can recognize it. And the comment is also written there uh, in plain text. But as you can see, the center part contains the, the first information, the type of the key as well. And other than that, it's really short and sweet, so you can see the hexadecimal 20, which is the length again, and that is followed by 32 bytes of key material, that's the public key. And now if I just uh, put this single line into the authorized key files in the home directory of the user in the .ssh subdirectory, I can just simply log in by using the minus i, which means identity, so that it will use the demo private key to log into localhost, and of course it worked because we just added it to it. So this is, this is really shows you how really simple logging into SSH using private keys is. And now there is the third option, SSH certificates, which is great, and uh, this should have a dedicated slide about it. So, in general, when we talk about certificates, it's just there is an issuer who issues the certificate and it signs a statement about the subject's private key. 
And this statement can include many different facts depending on what you want to use this as a certificate for. And in case of SSH, it's a really simple one. So most people associate certificates with uh, X509, which is the standard used for almost all certificates. So for example, TLS, uh, OpenVPN, IPsec, anything usually uses that format because it's convenient for some people, but in SSH, the serialization format is much simpler, and there is no multi-layer PKI. So for example, in most PKI systems, you have root certificate authorities, then you have a sub-certificate authority, then it delegates another one, and you can have a really huge chain, and of course, this chain also has the property that the weakest link is always the problem, and yet, uh, in this case, although, Technically, it would be possible to have such chains in SSH as well. There is no implementation that actually implements this horrendous feature because it doesn't make sense. And the best thing about it is it has an expiration. So even if your revocation strategy fails, there is a time when after that time the certificate won't be usable. And it can be revoked, of course, as well and it can also have limitations built into the certificate. Because as, as I mentioned uh, in the previous slide, you can put limitations on the server itself, but if you put it into the certificate, the server doesn't have to be notified because it will be right in there in the certificate. And since the certificate is signed cryptographically, the user cannot remove those limitations uh, without invalidating the signature and thus the certificate itself. And, uh, of course, the problem is that this way you put a lot of trust in the CA, and that will be uh, further explained later. And to say another negative thing about SSH certificates is that it's much less supported. So most SSH clients support password authentication and usually some form of public key. So for example, RSA keys work on most clients. Uh, 255 19 keys, not that much, but it still works in lots of clients, especially newer releases. Well, certificates, I haven't really seen anything other than OpenSSH supporting it. So, for example, if you try to use one of those uh, mobile apps, they usually don't support it. Uh, Putty, for example, doesn't support it. Uh, uh, WinSCP doesn't support it. And even in... in uh, in OpenSSH, there is not, not everything is supported. So for example, port forwarding can be enabled or disabled in certificates. But for example, if you use this uh, authorized keys uh, file, you can even limit what ports and what hosts can be forwarded. So not everything works as well, but at least there is support in OpenSSH. And, uh, the other interesting thing is that you can configure it uh, just by adding, of course, the CA key into the trusted user keys file. So you can specify a file which has a list of certificate authorities that the server will accept signatures from. And uh, if you've used uh, X509 certificates, you know that there is the common name and subject alt name fields which contain what this a certificate is valid for. In case of SSH, it has a list of so-called principles. And this can be two things. One, it can be a literal username. So if you have root in there, then the user can log in as root on the server. It can also be an uh, arbitrary string, and each user can have a list of principles that are valid for that user. So you can add the layer of indirection. So for example, if you have many servers and they are not managed centrally, so certain users have different usernames on different servers, you can create a level of indirection. So for example, you can put the user's email address in the principle, and then on each server you say that this email address belongs to this local user, because most Unix machines that I've seen are not managed like, you know, put into an AD domain or anything like that, so users, usernames might differ. And of course, you can always over-design. So for example, there's this authorized principles command, which works pretty much like the 
authorized keys, commands so that the server will run a program, read the standard output, and use that list as the list of principles that could be used to log in as that user. And of course, there's the revoked keys, which you can use to revoke otherwise valid certificates. So if you have a certificate that would be valid, but it's on the list of revoked keys, it won't be allowed into the system. And I can show you a simple demo about this one as well. So in this case, uh, I also need root access so that I can use it. But the first thing is the same as before. We use SSH keygen to generate a key, and I will call it client. And we'll generate another key with the same command called CA as certificate authority. And then what I'll do is just uh, sign it. With the minus I, I can give an identity which will not be used for technical purposes, so it won't be compared to anything. It's just to describe who this certificate is for, and it will be in system logs, so you can use it to identify the certificate itself. The minus S says what to sign it with, so in this case I will say the CA, public key. The minus N is the list of principles, which in case is just DNAT the name, and the client.pub is the public key to sign, because the CA, of course, only needs the public key. And it just said signed user key, and as you can see, the client.pub was automatically uh, used as, in, as a file name template, so it put a client-cert.pub file. And the serial number is zero, because if you don't supply it, it will just use zero, and like you can see, it said valid forever, because by default, if you don't give a validity, it will be valid forever, because it's an option, but you, cannot, you can just say it will expire, but this is a simple demo. You can see there is the client.cert.pub, and the next thing to see is, of course, look into it. And uh, interesting thing is, it starts with uh, SSH ED2559 cert, and uh, that doesn't mean what the public key inside is it, it's what the CA signed, uh, CA used to sign this certificate, which is interesting because if the two are not equal, you might have some surprises. And uh, of course we use the same base64 and HD trick to look into it. And as you can see, there are already some readable strings inside it. And if you, go, if you go to the top, you can see the uh, demo is there, and DNAT is there as well, so it's a really simple encoding. I could write a simple parser in like one hour, and it worked perfectly. And as you can see, there is the public key there, uh, hex to zero bytes, so 32 bytes. That's the public key of the user. And then at the end, there is the 0x40, so it's the 64-byte uh, signature. So the whole thing is really simple to recreate or verify. And of course, uh, we can see that's the CA's public key. And uh, that's the only thing we have to put into the SSH uh, configuration. So we switch to the root prompt, and we'll just say trusted user CA keys, like I said before, put a file name there, and put it into the SSH configuration. For example, in the Bion systems, there's this sshd config.d, which is a directory where every .conf file will be used. So now I'll just restart the, uh, reload the SSH daemon, and now I can just log in by using this convoluted command, because you need to give both the key and the certificate now to the client. You can, of course, put it into your SSH config, but here I want it to be really simple. And now you can log in without the server knowing about the client.pub. So now the server only knew about the CA public key, not the client public key, but because of the certificate, the server could see that there is a cryptographic connection between the two. So. Of course, I could log in. Phew, okay. And now I can show you what the identity was used for. So if I grab for demo in the authentication log, you can see that it put both the uh, ID, the serial number, and the, uh, the hashes of both the CA, 
public key and the user public key so that you have a really good audit trail of what's happening and why it's happening. So, the problem with CAs, uh, so if you have any kind of CA, you have to trust it because you will accept every key that is signed by that CA. What if the CA signs something that it shouldn't have because it got stolen, it got hacked, or maybe someone put a, uh, you know, there, there's this saying uh, that uh, silver or lead, so maybe, you're, maybe someone was bribed or maybe someone got, uh, got a gun to their head, so please sign this certificate now. What if that happens? You will accept that key. And how can the CA demonstrate that it, it uses a secure key? Because it's just a public key as any, anything else. It could be generated into a file like I showed you in the demo. Also, for example, you need to see whether the CA adheres to its own policy because the CA is like root. It can sign anything. What if it doesn't obey its own rules? What can you do? And of course, uh, the last, last four things are about like most things in IT, everything's great until everything's perfect. What if things go wrong? What if your CA is compromised? What if a user key is compromised? What if you issue a certificate improperly? Or what if some tokens are destroyed because you cannot make a copy of it, but because that's what the whole security depends on. So this is the problem so far. This was the, the what if it goes wrong and now comes our solution, how to solve it. And the first part of our solution is using attestation. I'm going to show you the YubiKey specific thing, but of course other vendors might have different uh, things. By the way, this talk is not sponsored by YubiKey. I bought these all by my own money, and uh, I'm just using them because it was what I found most easy, but it can be used with other vendors as well. And they say that the attestation is about certifying that the key was generated inside the device so that it has not left the device because of course you can say that I will generate a key outside the secure token and copy it into it and then I might not be sure that there hasn't been some other copy. And of course it's a matter of debate. Some people say that it's safer to generate it inside the device because then it's the only place in the universe where that key is present. Or you can say that you don't trust the own chip generator because it might have some entropy problems like the Roca attacks maybe two or three years ago where Estonia had to reissue every single uh, citizen its certificate because the RSA generator had a really low entropy so that it could be brute force from the public key. So this is a trade-off, but in case of uh, UBK, you can get an X509 certificate that proves with a chain of uh, certificates that it was generated on the device. The interesting thing is that PIV, uh, one of the, the APIs used by the device, of course, it uses X509 because that's what it already uses for other purposes. But even the open PGP engine uses X509, even though PGP never used X509, but I guess they already had the implementations there, so they used it. And in the end, you can parse this certificate chain using either OpenSSL, I'm going to show you a demo shortly, or using this cryptography.io, which is a really good cryptography library for Python. And if you do anything serious cryptography, I really recommend them because uh, they not only have quality code, they have quality documentation. Sometimes that even is more important. So let's see the demo. So in this case, I'm going to use the ykman utility and the openpgp command can be asked to attest the SIG signature certificate. I have to enter the pin, of course. And because I already done this before, it said a warning about I'm overwriting the signature. And if I use the OpenSSL X509 command, I can look into that attestation certificate. And right at the top, you can see it has the public key in it, all 20 bytes of them, which is really weird to see in an X509 certificate. And the subject is the SIG, like signature cert uh, certificate. 
and the issuer is the YubiKey OPGP attestation. We'll see how where that comes from. Of course, the signature is quite huge because the attestation process uses RSA keys. And if I use GPG edit card, I use the open PGP mode of YubiKey, uh, I can see what the public key, uh, key handle is. And if I export that public key uh, using the binary format and uh, look at the top of it, I can see that the key bytes are the same there. So if I put them right below, so I grab for the public key in the OpenSSL output, you can see that the public key starts with F7 and ends with 12. And the, the same uh, private key is right there, uh, public key is right there in the certificate. So it really attested the same certificate, uh, the same key. And then I can just say, look at the issuer, what I mentioned before, the YubiKey OPGP attestation. We can download this certificate from the device and it's really important to not overwrite it because if you overwrite it, you can never get it back because it was put there in the factory. Because that's the one that's signed by Ubico itself, the producer of this uh, hardware. So if I downloaded that attestation certificate, now I can see that the subject is the same as the issuer of the, of the one before and this is already signed by the Ubico CA, which I can download from their homepage using wget. I won't type that from head, so I had to copy paste it. And now that I downloaded all of them, of course I can look into that, but I rather, uh, yeah, you can see, you can look into it, and now you can see that the issuer and the subject are the same, so this is the end of the chain, this is the root certificate, which is self-signed by design, because that's how root certificates work. And now if I use the OpenSSL verify command, that can be used to verify a chain of certificates. So I will first see, uh, say that what the CA certificate is, so which is the uh, root of trust, and then I say dash untrusted and give the intermediate certificate, which I don't trust, and then at the end the leaf, and then it just prints okay if everything's been fine. So this is how you can verify it using simple command line tools. And uh, in our opinionated uh, way of thinking, attestation is necessary both for CAs, because there is much trust in CAs, and also necessary for regular users, and by regular I mean not technical users. So while technical users may be limited to issuing a single command, regular users can, you know, just authenticate and be trusted to run any command. So I believe that attestation is required so that they can prove that the key is not just some file in their computer that can be stolen by the Linux uh, exploit that was discovered last week. And the other part is OpenPGP. And uh, while, uh, for example, there are people here who likes to use uh, PGP, I have some huge problems with it. But uh, in this case, we won't use it for PGP. We will use it because the OpenPGP interface can be used to access a better crypto implementation in the, op in the YubiKey than the PIV API because it supports, for example, EDDSA, which is the Edwards curve uh, thingy, which is much better than RSA because the keys are shorter and you don't have to parse untrusted information when verifying signatures. And it's better than ECDSA because that requires a good random number generator. And as some game consoles show, if you don't use a good random number generator using an ECDSA signature, you'll have your private keys leaked. And how awesome is that? Uh, so EDDSA is much more secure, and the PIV doesn't support it, so you have to use the OpenPGP protocol to get such a signature. Of course, for everyday things, user experience is pretty sucky. Uh, while, for example, for PIV, there is uh, this YubiKey agent uh, GitHub repo, which has a really slick and works out of the box uh, methodology but that could be used, for example, for users and keeping uh, this AdWords skirt for, for example, CAs. And the next great thing is it has a signature counter. PIV doesn't have one, OpenPGP does, and it means that if you do a signature, that counter will be incremented in hardware, and it cannot be reset without erasing the private keys. Uh, but the problem is, in OpenPGP, you have the 
encryption key so that you can receive encrypted uh, emails and you have the signature key and the authentication key and while these two on a technical level are the same because they are both used for signing something either a message for the signature key or a or a challenge in case of an authentication key yet only the signing key has a counter. And even though, as I mentioned, GNU PG has an SSH emulation, that can only use the authentication key and not the signing key. And I tried, I, 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 I read all the how-tos on the internet, there is no way of forcing it. It just uses that. So if you want to get a signature counter, you have to use some other implementations. But first I'm going to show you how this signature counter works. So I use again the gpg edit card command. And by default when it launches it shows you that the signature counter is uh, 27. And now if I just copy the key handle so that I can be sure that that's what I'm going to use to sign a file. For example I put the string test into a file called test and I will sign it and uh, give the uh, local user the key handle so that I will assign it with that. The signature is complete and uh, if I just launch this edit card comment again, it will show that it has been incremented to 28. So it just works by default and it's implemented in the hardware. And as you can see, the signature is uh, there and I can even try to look into it and of course it says that signature is great. Good signature. So that's how this counter works. But yeah, it's, it's, it really sucks that it can be only used uh, for authentication. Uh, so because uh, GNU PG couldn't be used, I used this little low-level Python implementation that can talk directly to OpenPGP cards without GNU PG so that you can send low-level commands and uh, it works really well. The only problem I'd had is that uh, in case of ED25519, you don't send a hash to the signature. You send the whole message. And the problem was uh, this open PGP card communication format uh, used a different structure if your message was under 255 bytes or above. And hashes were usually under 255 bytes, but messages, for example, an open SSH certificate, were above it. And I had to implement this logic into it, so that's there in the, in the pull request. And I can show you a demo how it works. Although it's not much that of a demo because you couldn't really see things other than lines scrolling on my screen. So in this case, I will show you the, the source code. So it gives you an open PGP card uh, class and you can instantiate it. And you can then use it just get data command you can, for example, request uh, the signature counters and then you'll have to do this unpack thing because uh, it has a 24-bit counter, but of course 24-bit is not something that most programming languages support, so I have to prepend a zero byte so that I will get a 32-byte counter and I can, you know, unpack it. And then I can just get the value and use it. And then for authenticated things, I have to use this verify pin call and, oh my, and give it the, the password that I got from the user. And then, for example, I can read the public key out without uh, any problems. Uh, so this is all hard-coded ED25519 because that's the only thing I want to support. And here comes the trick. I will call SSH key again, but set the environment variable for the SSH authentication agent socket to my own, which I created in the line above. And this way, SSH key again will think that it's communicating the minus U said use the agent. Uh, it will think it is communicating with an agent, but in reality, it will communicate the same script that is calling it and of course I, can also, uh, I will also set the certificate uh, validity to the preset date and set the, the, uh, the serial number to the counter so that each certificate will uh, have its unique counter value and set the identity to a value that can be used to trace it in log files. So if we scroll back to the top, 
Uh, you can see that the identity and principle are set there, either to command line options, or in this case, you can see that the, the, uh, the principle is set to the email address, and the identity is set to the YubiKey serial number, so that you can say, okay, this user logged in with this physical YubiKey, and as long as you know that the YubiKey is in the physical possession of the user, it's a form of non-repudiation. Non and then I open the Unix socket, because SSH uses that, and then execute the SSH keygen, so the socket is already open, and this way I don't have to use uh, multiple threads, because the keygen is already running, yet I'm already listening on the socket, and they are executing in parallel. And then first it will request the identities, and I will answer with that single identity which I read from the device, in which case identity means uh, public key. And then when it says, okay, here's this sign request, I will just extract it from the request, and using this mydevice.sign, I will send it to the device for si signature. So my script is translating between SSH and OpenPGP, much like the GNU PG emulation, but it's much simpler because it's only for this single use case. And then when the response arrives, I will just send it back to the, to the SSH uh, key, key again, which produces a certificate that can be read back from the standard output. I split them by spaces because you could see that format, and I'm only interested in number one, which is the second because it's zero-based, and I base64 decode it, and there I have a certificate which was signed by a signing key, which has a signature counter attached to it, and I think that's a must-have for CAs because that's the only way you can audit how it is made. So it's, it's easy and it works. And maybe if, if, you don't, if you haven't understood that source code, I made this diagram so that you can see how it works. So the ZSCA is the Zero Trust uh, SSH CA. That's my project in the center. And first it calls you OpenPGPy, give me the signing pub key, and I name that Y. And then it sends to the SSH key again, please sign public key X with the Y public key. And then SSH will ask, okay, what keys you have? Because it thinks that this is another agent. Of course, it will answer, I only have Y. And then it says, okay, sign this P payload with Y. It will forward that to OpenPGPy. And then it sends back the signature, it forwards back the signature. And there you have a certificate. Well, with some detours, but at least it works. And my attacker model was, I, even though, of course, you have the, the CA in a hardware token, and you can verify it because the attestation. And you have a pin, and after three wrong pins, the device will erase the private keys. Yet, my attacker model says that the attacker is presumed that it can make the CA sign either because the password is wrong, for example, because the password has to be entered on the PC because the device doesn't have a keypad itself, that could be intercepted. Or, as I already mentioned, people can be bribed, people can be, uh, can be forced, yes, thank you. People can be forced to make it, so my attacker model all includes this. And the trick is that I compare whether the number of certificates in the database is the same as the signature counter. Because if the attacker saves the signed certificate into the database, then during an audit you can see, what the fuck does that certificate does there? Why is it there? Who authorized this? If it's not in the database, then the counter won't match. So there is really no way out of this situation because what I wanted from such a security system is not that it cannot be hacked because that's impossible. What I wanted was that if it's hacked, it cannot be hacked silently. As soon as you do an audit, it will pass out. And of course, you can ask, but what if you don't do an audit? And that's why I put the Dijkstra uh, quote there that testing shows presence, not the absence of bugs. So you can never say that I can prove that my system was not hacked. I can prove that my system was hacked, but that's a really, uh, really important stuff so that you can see if you were hacked. And of course, there are other tests as well. So for example, I will uh, look whether every attestation uh, chain is valid, so there are, there are no 
uh, no trusted keys, which are for users and not technical users, which are not within uh, secure hardware tokens. I will uh, check whether the attestation certificate indicates that it's a hardware generated keys, because you can get an attestation from, a, from an imported key, but it will indicate that uh, fact inside the signed certificate. I will see whether it matches the YubiKey ID of the user. And of course, I will see whether the SSH certificate is valid and unique so that an attacker, for example, wouldn't say that, okay, so that the certificate count, uh, the sign signature uh, counter would match, I will just copy an already signed certificate and now you have every record which is valid. So that's why I need to check uh, uniqueness and validity because if it just com uh, copies a valid certificate, changes a byte, it will be unique, but it won't be valid. And uh, yeah. And of course, I will also check the policy. So for example, the expiration date must be within the pre-configured limit so that, for example, administrators couldn't say that, I don't want to renew my certificate. I will just override it and put it one year and I will be much happier. This is why audits are necessary. And uh, maybe this list is not complete. Uh, in the end, I will show you the address of the repository. Please prove me wrong. Prove that you could hack this system because I would be really glad. Uh, I sent it to some really smart people and they couldn't find one, but that doesn't mean it's perfect. So, so the end result is really interesting. In the end, I have a, a simple Python Django script. And uh, the great thing is I could publish it within my organization and frankly I could even publish it outside my organization because there are no secrets in it. There are certificates, but those only contain public keys. The attestation chains, they only contain public keys. So there is nothing in there that could be abused by an attacker to log into the system. So anyone, it could be put in a public location within your organization and everyone can download it and inspect them on their own machines using their own scripts, for example, if they don't trust the central one. And uh, while I'm using Python and Django, because for example, that OpenPGP Pi was in Python and Django has a good uh, ORM, it could be implemented in any other language and uh, it, I just used it because. And while many people hate PGP, this uses nothing that PGP hatred is based on. So for example, their dumb uh, formats, which are complicated. It doesn't use GNU PG, it doesn't use key servers, it doesn't use Web of Trust. So it only uses OpenPGP because it gives access to ED25519 and signature counters. And many people hate certificates. I do as well. But this uses nothing that most of the hatred is focused on. So there is no sub-certificate authorities that could be abused. And there is no X509, which is based on ASN1, which is so tricky that, for example, Cisco could do a parsing bug that could lead to a remote code execution in a single UDP packet. So X509 is bad, but this doesn't use that. And, uh, since I already use Django, I want to make a web, web interface so that people, for example, can download their new certificates using WGET and uh, maybe at a self-service renewal where the user logs in and can authenticate and then receive the certificate if I don't want to publish everybody's certificates to everybody, even though you cannot really use a certificate without the private key, but who knows. And um, the other problem is if you've used PGP, when you first set up, you always get three keys. The signing key, the encryption key, and the authentication key. And it signs them with a so-called self-signature, which is put on the same key ring, but that also means that the signature counter starts from three. And now you have a problem. You can either say, okay, I trust myself that these were only used for PGP, well, what if it's not? So right now, my view of saying is, okay, I will trust that I did that myself, so it works. But the best way would be if the same system could import those three signatures and include it in the audit trail so that you can say, okay, these three signatures also match. So just the fact that the signature counter starts from three doesn't mean anything bad. It's just how the GNU PG works because that's what I use to initialize the devices. And uh, all the source code and binaries uh, are there under MIT. 
and it's in the works for me state. So I already used it in some texting cases, but uh, pull requests are welcome if it doesn't work for you and you can offer a way to fix it. And last but not least, our company is hiring. So if you're a Panthester in Hungary uh, or you want to lock, uh, relocate to Hungary, <laughs> then you're welcome to join our ranks. Uh, we are a really small 12 years old company, so I guess we are sustainable maybe. Um, and that's what I want to talk to you. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Questions? Uh, have you thought about using TPM2 instead of YubiKeys? Sorry? Have you thought about using TPM2 instead of YubiKeys? TPM instead of YubiKeys, uh, my problem is that I like the removability of the, of the stuff and, and that I can say that if it's not plugged into the computer, it cannot be abused. And the fact that it has that golden disk, you can set up your private key so that it only does a signature, for example, if you touch it. So even if it's plugged in, uh, someone, an attacker that is already on your machine cannot say that it will just ask for a signature because you have to touch it physically. So I like that uh, plus factor. Um, so yeah, maybe TPM could be used. But for servers, for example, for automated operations, like automated deployments and that kind of stuff. It's a top it's a tough question because uh, you want to use it as CA or client keys. Client. For client keys, you can use anything. Uh, the client keys, you can see, even use key files. So if you can use key files, you can also use TPM. So it's not limiting in that regard. If you can uh, import the key into the database, it will accept it and treat it as such. So you can use it with a TPM. The, the YubiKey aspect is only used for, for physical users and the certificate authority, because that needs the... Because of attestation. Because of, not just attestation, I, I need for, for CA because the signature counter, and so that I can, for example, only plug it into a computer when signing certificates, for example, once a month. And otherwise I can store it in a, for example, in a safe. Okay. Questions? Come on. Did you, uh, did you ever run into a problem with rate limitation of YubiKeys? Rate limitation of YubiKeys? No, I haven't. Do you? Uh, yeah, so I heard that uh, you can only sign so many keys per time with YubiKeys. Is there a pro license? <laughs> uh, yeah. It's interesting uh, because in these cases, you are only using it once per signature or in case of users, once per login. So that's why I, I, my use cases don't really cover situations where, where more than one signature is requested in a short amount of time. So, so no, I haven't. Although, for example, you can run into problems if you use it in their OTP mode where their cloud service needs to be used to verify it. Of course, you can run it yourself but then you, again, have a single point of failure. So that's why I don't really recommend that OTP solution to anyone. Yeah? So uh, this is only for authentication, right? And, uh, yeah. And uh, what do, is it only for authentication against an SSH server? Or can I set up my, I don't know, my media wiki and log in with my UV key no, it's signature? For, for web web things, I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend it. This is this is really strictly for SSH. Okay. And if you want to log in using YubiKeys, I would say this uh, Fido2 and uh, such things are much better because then the user cannot be easily correlated. So this, this SSH certificate is mostly for incorporate stuff where you use a single key because that's the, you, you don't have a privacy aspect because people already know who you are and what you are doing. And for a media wiki, I, I would say it, it's really great that people cannot correlate which, where, where you use the same hardware key to log into. Okay. So it's SSH only. SSH only, but for example, we are planning on using it as a, as a, 
as a jump off point so that it's, uh, it can be used to protect network services which only been to localhost and then you use an SSH certificate so that you use a port forward to access that localhost bound stuff and in that case you are protecting a service with it. Of course the service won't know about you so it's, it's mostly a hardening scheme so that if there's anything wrong with that service it's harder to exploit. Yeah? Uh, what's the story of a lost CIT? Good question and I haven't addressed it but I wanted to so thank you very much sir. Um, so for these cases lost is a problem and because it's hardware it can just break anytime because just a static discharge or anything. So our take is using uh, two keys and add both of them to all the machines as trusted key and always use them alternatively so that both are tested always so there is no such case that one silently fails you always use the other and we say oh I now need to use the backup and all the backup has been dead for months. So yeah that's a problem and, and the funny thing is that if you don't use it for encryption you can because of this case if a user breaks his YubiKey you don't have to have already one at their, uh, in their uh, uh, on their uh, set because you can just add the, have a uh, certificate signed and it will be trusted by everyone because it's signed by the CA key so it makes them is it why for example if you use it for encryption you already have to set it up everywhere because you cannot go back with the time machine and have every encrypted message encrypted to both of the recipients so if you only use it for, for login, you have to have at least two CA keys, but only one key per user is okay. And of course you need to have some spare ones because if it breaks, you cannot tell the user, okay, I will just order one and hope it arrives in time. So for example, we have a few of them just there empty and ready for deployment. Questions? Okay, um, you can ask me anytime later tonight or in the next three days. Thank you again.